Hi, Sean McElroy here. Hope everyone out there is doing well. We're here with our AutoLine exclusives, and joining me today is Chris Robinson, a senior analyst at Lux Research. Chris, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's a pleasure. Yeah, and we're going to talk about Hyperloop. You know, big buzz kind of started around 2012 when Elon Musk started talking about Hyperloop. Chris, can you give us a little, a bit of an idea of what a Hyperloop is? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, really, it's kind of like a high-speed train, um, but the concept focuses on just removing as much friction as possible um, with the idea that you're going to improve speed. So some components are borrowed from existing high-speed trains. So a lot of them use things like magnetic levitation and propulsion technologies from high-speed trains today. Uh, but the biggest differentiator is enclosing the train in a vacuum tube. Um, so removing all of the air that comes, or all of the friction that comes from air, um, allowing from speeds more similar to what you might get from an aviation or aircraft. Yeah, so from my understanding, there's been a number of concepts that have come out from different companies, even colleges. And I think even last year, there was a, a company that got close to about, say, 300 miles per hour with their Hyperloop in a test. So you know, that kind of makes me think that maybe we're getting kind of close to this. I know your company has done a lot of research into Hyperloop and, you know, where the technology might be and how the projects are coming along. Are we close to seeing these Hyperloops? Uh, what do you think? Well, it's certainly been a lot of progress since uh, the concept was proposed, um, or maybe I should say reproposed by Elon Musk in 2012. Um, but the reality is we're talking about really big infrastructure projects. Um, you know, that are going to require, you know, a lot more validation, a lot more testing, and a lot more kind of safety regulations to kind of guide what these systems are going to look like from a commercial perspective. So from a timeline, um, you know, it's difficult to say. Um, we look closer to a 20-year timeline, so looking at maybe 2040 as a time when you might start to see some of these systems commercialized. Um, there's a lot of progress, but there also remain a lot of barriers. Um, you know, we don't necessarily need one singular technology breakthrough to make this happen. Um, it's feasible with all of the existing components uh, today, but uh, they haven't been tested in the same conditions that you might want uh, to operate a Hyperloop in, in terms of, you know, the speed and, and the vacuum we're talking about. So I know like a lot of proponents for this are saying around 2030, but you guys are kind of saying maybe 10 years out beyond that. What are some of the things that might be holding them back or maybe they're really optimistic on? Well, you know, certainly the testing is one of them. Um, you know, right now, this is still a concept where we would more define it as something in the research and development stage. Um, there are a handful of test tracks available today um, that are being used. Um, but generally, these are, you know, either a full scale diameter, but um, don't achieve quite the speeds you would expect from a full scale system or you know, some of them are using smaller diameter, smaller scale tests, which are all still valuable and important steps toward commercialization. Um, but we still need to see these systems validated at full scale and full speed. Um, but even if we were to have these systems validated at a full speed and, and scale, um, there are also, you know, there are some significant uh, regulatory and commercial barriers. So, you know, the Department of Transportation here in the United States has only just started looking at how to regulate these. And there are some complex challenges if you think about, uh, you know, how do you ensure in the event of a failure that you can evacuate passengers um, when you're talking about an environment that's in a near vacuum conditioned in, a, in an enclosed tube. Um, and then even if you were to solve all of the technical and regulatory barriers, there's still a challenge of, you know, once again, these are multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects um, and you need to acquire land rights, secure funding for it. So there's still, um, you know, kind of a lot of barriers, even if you were to solve the technical barriers um, before you're going to see one of these systems um, developed and um, carrying passengers today. And so, you know, you talk about passengers there a little bit. I think one thing that might be a misconception among people is this is not like a typical train where you have people, you know, bunched up right against one another. You were talking a little bit about diameters of tubes and stuff like that. What might these pods that are flying through these tubes actually look like? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think that's where a lot of the work right now is being spent today is how do you design a pod, um, both from the technical perspective of, you know, putting something through a tube, you know, you need to be careful about, you know, making sure too much pressure doesn't build up at the front. So there's kind of the external aerodynamic considerations. 
Um, there's also the question of how do you get people in and out of the tooth, right? Because if we're talking about um, a pod that's inside of a vacuum, it's not trivial to necessarily get people in and out without you know, breaking that vacuum um, or having some sort of airlock. Um, but the concept originally proposed would be you know, something smaller than a train where you might have you know, maybe 30 to 40 people in, in one kind of smaller pod moving um, at a time. Yeah. And, you know, what are some of like, I, I, I feel like I remember there were some ridiculous speeds that were quoted for these things, like uh, being able to go between LA and San Francisco in like 30 minutes or something like that. Yeah, the speed is, um, you know, that's another big question mark. Um, generally, the target is somewhere in the 800 to 700 mile per hour range. But you know, there is kind of this big trade-off where the faster you go, the more expensive it costs because you essentially need more energy to move that pot along. Um, so, you know, really what the ultimate speed is, it's probably going to be more determined by a cost optimization of what's the most cost-efficient regime to run in um, necessarily than what is the absolute fastest one of these systems can go. Um, you know, from a testing perspective, you know, we've seen somewhere in the 250 to 300 mile per hour range. Um, a little bit on the lower end for some of the full-scale systems, um, like Virgin Hyperloop is testing, and um, on the higher end for some of the smaller scale systems um, that are being tested, um, you know, at the Hyperloop competition at the university level. So I know I have seen at least like a few little tests here and there. I feel like there's a two-mile loop somewhere in California. You know, what's are, are any of these testing centers? Uh, are there any testing centers that are scheduled to come along? I'm just curious as to where that might stand. Yeah, there are a few. Um, you know, the, the one in California is probably one of the more well-known ones because that is where the competition um, for the university is held. And that's at just under a two meter diameter. Um, and most people believe you're talking about three and a half to four meter diameters for a full passenger carrying system. Um, so that's valuable. Um, but they're looking at maybe expanding that in, in future um, competitions to be something closer to you know, maybe that five to 10 mile range. Um, but elsewhere in, in Europe, um, there has been a little bit more focus on, on testing and putting these systems in place in Europe. Um, you know, just from a geography perspective, um, you have a more densely uh, populated area and, um, you know, European uh, countries have kind of started developing consortiums to, to develop some testing. And um, they're looking at another one uh, through a company called Heart Hyperloop, which is looking at, I'm developing a, a three kilometer test track, um, full scale and, and ideally full speed um, within probably three to four years. Um, so those are, are kind of the, the bigger ones um, as well. I feel like a lot of these companies uh, might be a bit bullish on it. Um, I've read some stuff to where they feel like there's gonna be a big acceleration in infrastructure spending by the government. Is that, another sort of thing that is going to be needed to be able to help pay for these systems? They sound extremely expensive. Yeah, and that's that's certainly a big question mark. I mean, no one's really sure what one of these costs. I know there was a really low estimate in the original white paper um, that, that Elon Musk proposed um, with, with his engineers. And I think since then, if we look at some of the proposed projects in India, for example, um, the estimated cost per mile are significantly higher than that original paper. Um, so certainly from an investment and in infrastructure perspective, it's really going to be a matter of where are governments going to want to prioritize spending? Um, you know, is it going to be on existing infrastructure, um, like larger road projects or other rail or aviation projects, or, you know, are they going to want to investigate one of these new modes? Um, and I think it's, it's a little bit early to tell how excited governments are. I think really where we are right now, we're seeing some commercial feasibility studies, um, so, so you've probably seen them, but here in the U.S., I know there are a few proposed routes in, you know, Missouri and in the Midwest, connecting cities like Chicago and Cleveland and, and possibly Pittsburgh. Um, so we're, we're very early stage in trying to understand, you know, from a feasibility perspective, what one of these routes might cost. Gotcha, gotcha. So it, it seems like we need to get all of, some of the smaller ones up and going, maybe to get some, you know, more awareness about these things. Yeah, and certainly, you know, building some of these more expanded test facilities will go a long way in doing that. Um, you know, a lot of these commercial feasibility studies focus on, well, if the technology works as promised, here's what the cost might look like. Um, but building these full-scale systems will certainly build confidence in, uh, in those systems.
Well, no, I, I mean, I, I find it very interesting. You know, uh, you've got the proponents for this talking about, you know, we feel like we can be up and running by 2030. You've got people like your research company that's looking into this and saying maybe, hey, it might even be 2040. Uh, it, it just seems like you never know. Uh, you've got government regulation probably holding this back, more testing that needs to be done. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see where all that falls. And, you know, even kind of relating that to today's environment, I saw something else that maybe this whole COVID-19 uh, might spur the government to spend more on infrastructure and in particular non-polluting transportation. And, you know, Hyperloop's kind of like uh, right in that space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, something we haven't mentioned yet. Um, and I think one of the motivations, especially for Europe, is that, you know, the idea is this can replace a lot of those maybe middle range flights. Um, and aviation is a sector that's really hard to decarbonize. You know, we can put uh, an electric powertrain in a vehicle um, and power that by renewable energy. And that's, you know, going to drastically reduce emissions. But, you know, for the, the power and energy requirements you look at for an airplane, it's it's not so easy to, you know, adopt an electric infrastructure or, or I'm sorry, a powertrain in, in those types of vehicles. So um, that is one of the promises, um, you know, exactly how much governments are going to be willing to spend on that. I think, you know, only time will tell. Yeah, no, it, it's very interesting. Hyperloop's one of those things. It's a big buzzword right now. People uh, seem to be very interested in it. But, uh, you know, maybe there's some more things we need to look at here to, to really get it hammered down. And it might be coming on a little bit long, uh, a little bit later than we all thought. I suppose that's the case with most technologies, uh, especially, um, you know, bigger infrastructure projects like this. But uh, yeah, certainly exciting, uh, exciting technology to look at. Yeah, Chris Robinson from Lux Research. I want to thank you for joining us today and talking all about Hyperloop. Yeah, thank you very much, Sean. It was a pleasure. Yeah.